Look, we, we're missing our engineer today, David. Unfortunately, uh, he's stuck at some uh, building site, so it's uh, just Charles and myself. Um, but uh, just, just to give you some context, so this presentation is, is uh, sort of increasing the technical sort of, uh, I guess, difficulty, right? So we start fairly easy and then it gets, I guess, a little bit more, more messy. Um, we also sort of start with a bit of sort of bigger context and then dive in into the Australian context and uh, even sort of closer home to the uh, New South Wales, which is the state we are in uh, context. Um, I think, you know, the one point to note is that, I mean, this is just this big problem that we have in the building industry, right, over here, but, you know, it's a, it's a problem that, you know, it's also uh, seen elsewhere uh, in the world. And um, to solve that, we brought a multidisciplinary team together, and that's how we like to work um, to, to bring those different perspectives. So the, the, the solution that we'll talk about today is something that we did probably two or two or three years ago. And at the time it was an idea, well now it has sort of morphed actually into a solution and it's in the market. So, uh, so some of the stuff that you're sort of seeing today was our thinking back then, but now actually it works. So let's just move to the first slide, if I can make it work. Ah, here you go. So I'm uh, setting the, the scene. So, um, so when things go really bad in the, in the high-rise buildings, you know, they, they, they can be really catastrophic, right? Uh, in Australia, people would know about Opal Towers, the mascot towers. There's a number of pu well-publicized uh, examples when, when things didn't go well. Um, in Australia, that was cracking of a building of Opal Towers, which led to financial distress and financial loss and, and a massive re remediation bill. Uh, but when you go overseas, the catastrophes were much bigger. So everyone would have heard about uh, Benford Towers, right? Uh, everyone would have heard probably about what was going on in the US um, with the uh, Champlain Towers, uh, resulted in, in big uh, damage and, and, and more importantly, loss of, uh, loss of life. So if we bring it a little bit sort of closer home, um, Sorry. Uh, in, in New South Wales, uh, recently there was a study done when around 500 buildings, high-rise buildings were, were surveyed just to sort of see how good the quality was. And out of those 500 uh, buildings, around 36% 30, of them were found to have critical structural uh, defects. So, I mean, as you can sort of uh, see from the previous examples, right, you know, those, those structural defects can actually lead to some big catastrophes. And, you know, so far we've been lucky in Australia, I guess, in some ways, right, but, you know, but it's, it's not a pretty picture. So, um, so there are different ways uh, people sort of argue around, you know, what actually, um, what actually is sitting behind, you know, some of the, some of the uh, causes of the issues that are plugging the construction industry. But the fundamental outcome is that there is lack of trust and transparency. So underlying all of that is the problem of information asymmetry. So a developer holds all the information but can only signal through price that they are trustworthy and high quality builder. A lower quality builder can cut corners, uh, can, uh, can raise prices, can hide lower quality workmanship, uh, materials and designs that will go unnoticed to the trained, untrained eye. And even if you're actually a, a sophisticated you know, person, right, a trained sort of person, you still, you still really need to go through quite an expensive process to actually find where are the issues and, and really sort of prove that uh, there's poor quality. So, you know, so traditionally there have been different ways of dealing with this. I mean, from, from building standards, right, to insurance. Um, you know, if I just pick building standards, I mean, yes, they normally work, right? In some jurisdictions, they work better than others. But fundamentally, you know, there are various sort of challenges there around, you know, whether they vague or, or clear, right, to apply, whether they keep up with the technology sort of changes and the building process changes. And then, you know, whether they actually are enforced throughout the system. And, and I think that's what we have sort of seen a little bit in Australia and, and New South Wales, uh, certainly. So... So then, you know, it comes, then it comes down to this pub chat, right, that we've had, you know, a few years ago, right? So the system is clearly, clearly in, in crisis. Um, in a way, we have a perfect storm, so we have all those highly publicized issues coming through. Um, 
and you know, and, and then there is you know general sort of I guess unhappiness, right, about how the things are going. So so what we thought though is that you really need a combination of of technology, data science, engineering, and construction knowledge to actually solve the problem, to actually address this uh, information asymmetry issue that we've been dealing with. Um, so the, the New South Wales government um, and the leadership of, of David Chandler, uh, so com building's uh, commissioner, has, has started you know, some reforms, you know, has, has put in this six pillar uh, construct of New South Wales uh, reform. And really, you know, and there are different aspects to it, right? Because it's a complex problem, so you have to solve it in, in multi, multi, for multi, multiple perspectives. But really, you know, for, for what we'll be talking about today and, and the rest of this presentation will be about is really the pillars two and five, which really go back to that sort of creating a rating systems using that sort of data technology and some smart analytics to address uh, the asymmetry of information that exists in the system. So very simply, um, what we, what we did, right, and it's, it's, it's a really simple process, right? It's essentially you get all the different types of data that you require to, to solve the problem. So you have, you know, the information about who actually has, has built a building, right, or been involved in that process. You get the information about uh, the, the materials that have been used, about the processes, what certificates have been sort of applied throughout this process, because, you know, it's a multi-stage process. And then once you have all of this information, you throw it effectively into a pot, right? And then you have to find some smart way to make sense of it and, and actually bring it into, into the, the final step, which is some sort of index, some sort of indicator that for, you know, whether you're a customer, whether you're an insurer, whether you're a banker or regulator, that you can actually start differentiating that quality of the building, right, from the poor to the high. So at this point, I'll pass on to Charles to talk about the, the more complex stuff. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Bartos. He, uh, he probably owes me a few more pints after this, same as David. So uh, I'll try and put on my engineer's hat uh, for the time being. So when we talk about DNA, what are we talking about? Uh, next slide is this. Cool. Um, so you see an example here of um, a certificate that is about structural concrete. Um, this is one of the nicest examples that we could come up with. Um, a lot of the engineers, the engineering certificates are actually just handwritten, emailed, and they're stored in various systems. Um, most likely in an email system, but if you're getting into larger construction projects, maybe a BIM, so Building Information Management System. Um, this is typically uh, machine readable in some instances, but a lot of the cases it's you know almost as, as bad as abstract art in certain circumstances. Um, so, I think David described it um, as abstract art. I think um, one of our partners, risk partners, said it was uh, creative, maybe mischievous in some certain situations. So, what are the challenges with these certificates? Well, they're actually not very standardized. Um, each company doing the certification would have their own formatting. Um, a lot of the times, the certificates and the number of um, checks that you have to do per certificate is not standardized either level of assurance to all these certifications is different, and uh, you'll probably also have expert judgment inside these um, certifications as well. So already a very hard task. The next bit is to actually figure out how much of these individual certificates are worth. Um, now this was a laborious process that KPMG um, did with the industry, um, so we talked to quantitative surveyors, civil engineers, a lot of the uh, builders and developers, and we try to come up with a framework that says a particular certificate is worth a particular amount of credit, and we actually surveyed the industry of what that credit was. So underlying all of these distributions and all these point estimates, there's actually distributions from the industry. Now the industry, uh, if, if just keep this in mind, we've got a distribution at the back of the, in the back end of this. The industry does have divergent views on some of these and how much of these particular worth, and We'll see how they are interplayed when we get to the expert system. So this tells us what the individual certificates are worth. Uh, the next bit of the process is about making sense of the whole system, the whole building. 
So to do that, our expert system is a Bayesian network. Um, the topology basically tells you how the risk traverses through the building or through the different systems. It's just different systems. Um, we've got a little discrete example here. Um, it's a fire safety example. We've got a detection system, we've got a sprinkler system, and we've got an alarm system. And I'm sorry for if you can see it, but they are actually pointed in terms of a directed graph. So at the base of it, you do have a detection system, then there's a warning system that follows, and then the sprinkler sits on top of those systems. So as this example, um, if we were to, to do it naively, if we did an average of the certificates, we would say, you know, uh, 444 leads to a 4 average, but in this case, um, when we spoke to the fire safety engineers, they said, you know, sprinklers and detec detection are exactly the same, the, the exact things that don't need to be wrong. You could have no warning systems and you'll just get um, unhappy exiters from the buildings that are wet, but alive. So that was a very simple example, but we could theoretically put this into a distribution. And this is where we had a lot of talk with quantitative surveyors, we had a lot of talk with civil engineers, and we had a lot of talk with uh, the data scientists at KPMG. And what we came up with was a fairly sophisticated network um, that has evolved since, but it's basically the same shape. What we have is sort of the waterproofing in the middle with the teal. We've got enclosure, which is the building exterior. We've got structural elements in green. Um, we've got uh, the slightly dark blue as the services, so your lift services, your HVAC services, and also your fire services in red. And what you have on the right-hand side is the distributions that we've been collecting from the certificates. So these are what the industry expects each certificate is worth, and then as they propagate through the network, um, you get a holistic view of where the risk pass or where the risk uh, lies versus your um, assurance um, framework that you've got. Ooh. So, um, now I've got to turn on my software engineering hat here. Um, so, that was basically all the near engineering and civil engineering components. How do we actually sort of um, implement this and implement it to scale? Sorry. So we, we, we came up against this and we had stored our information and the first thing we went to was relational databases. Um, your typical relational database that basically stores all these things in tabular form. What we found out very quickly was when we try to implement this in relational databases, the, some of the recursive nature and some of the self-referential um, queries that we were doing were actually very, very hard to implement in SQL you could implement something that pre-processes it into a view and whatnot, but then you lose some of the dynamic nature of the queries that you would like to ask. I'll talk about what sort of those queries would be later on, but as a graph database, um, on the left-hand side, uh, I've got this little toy example of, you know, an IMDB database that describes basically movies, actors, relationships. On the left-hand side, you've got your typical relational database schema, and on the right-hand side, you've got a vertex and edge view of the world when we're looking at it from a graph database view. So, what is the essential difference? Well, as I said, recursiveness is very bad, badly handled in relational databases. It's, it, it's, it's relational, but it's not quite relational. It's actually easier to represent things when you're trying to look at paths and risk paths in the graph database world. So the graph database world is actually also very semantically nice because you can explain it to your stakeholders in terms of some of the references you'll come across later. So uh, this, this is not a test. So a simple query to basically just select a person from, um, from the movie database. We've got Tom Hanks. We've got Cypher, which is just, a, it's just another SQL ver variant, but it could be uh, GraphQL as well. Uh, Cypher is a proprietary version of the um, software software package that we use, which is Neo4j. But basically, you can just you know match select a person called Tom Hanks from your database and return him as a person P. Similarly, you can do that with your relational database. All right. 
The next type of query is the query that we probably would want to run when we're looking at some of these risk paths and some of these risk um, aggregations. And you, you do this dynamically, but with this is a static example of finding co-actors for Tom Hanks. Now, if you remember back to the schema that we, I just popped up, um, this, the, the schema basically requires you to go into these different tables to extract out whether they have been co-acting or not co-acting with Tom Hanks through a particular movie. And so your select statement there is quite, quite nasty and it's actually quite rigid in terms of where you're looking at. So if I asked you to write this to the second two relationships away, um, then you'll probably have to insert quite a few more tables. You have to remove duplicates because Tom Hanks and the um, common, or common actors within the same movie to the second degree uh, have to be removed as well. So quickly it becomes infeasible to kind of look at some of these relationships that you have within your risk, um, risk topology. So what does that all mean? It means, it means we get to basically represent a uh, building in terms of its structural, uh, its constituent components in a very nice digital twin fashion of what are the components, what are the risk paths, but also it all allows us to sort of interface into some of these other interfaces. So in this case, we've got a uniclass BIM. Uh, it's just a type of building information management system that typically people use. Um, uniclass is what New South Wales government has been using for Transport New South Wales, a lot of their built environments. And it's just basically like a classification, um, classification um, hi hierarchical data, data schema that um, they've, they've been using in New South Wales government. Now, you could plug this into anything that you like, some other BIM, some other software, you know, the Bunnings Isle that you're looking at to buy material for, for these buildings. But essentially it allows you to convert from one, one instantiation into another instantiation. So I guess, Graph databases has us actually enabled us to sort of really chug along and look at um, some of the computation things that we have. Um, it's also scalable, so you could shard the databases in terms of its constituent components, have one server run the fire safety, have one server run some other components of the graph. And um, it's been instrumental in terms of what we've been looking at um, in terms of the risk path. So all of this, is then sort of topped off with a distributed ledger. Um, I hate to use the word blockchain, but it's just basically a blockchain. What happens is um, all the certifying bodies also participate on this distributed ledger. Um, your certificates are stored within the graph database, and then you've got users of the graph database, whether it's you know the regulator, whether it's the insurer, whether it's your public member, you could get a level of granularity that basically suits your needs and uh, looks at the rating that you've um, then produced as an aggregate. So I've got a minute left. Go to our very last slide. So what's next? Um, I think the, the very first thing is to sort of expand the adoption and to actually finish the calibration of this, this work. Um, what I mean by that is currently it's calibrated towards what the builders and the building industry expects. There are various other use cases. You could write on top of this, you know, in your, the insurance view, whether it's, you know, dollars per failure you've seen in your data. Um, but there are various other use cases that we'd like to expand and probably also adopt into other jurisdictions. Um, what else? Um, we could actually use this in other various, various other um, instances. I think um, decarbonization, carbon credit certification, uh, material traceability. A lot of the um, situations where you have asymmetry of information in the industry. So maybe, for example, health ratings. Um, so I think this has a lot of applicability. Certainly the way that we've worked with the civil engineers, worked with the software engineers and the actuaries at KPMG. Um, I think we can extract a lot of learnings out of this and um, hopefully help out in other areas as well. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Charles. Uh, the iPad's not working, um, just for change. But um, I was very interested in, in terms of what was the hardest thing about building this model. It seems that there were two things. One was um, you must have made a lot of calls how to squeeze all the information down to a single judgment about 
the overall rating, you know, it's just one number. But two, you had a huge challenge to actually extract the data from reading the various certificates and stuff. What would you say was the, the hardest part of it? I can, I can probably start. So I think that the, the big challenge, so the first big challenge that we had is that actually there was no consistent taxonomy to describe a building. So that was very quickly we sort of found that actually there are so many different systems and subsystems. I think we're looking at what 15,000 sort of different little points that you would have in there, right? So just to get alignment with the industry, with the construction industry, and all of the different uh, uh, experts on that was, was a massive exercise. Uh, it certainly has taken quite a few different uh, conversations and months uh, in terms of duration. Um, once we had that sort of part uh, sorted, then, then we, we had around our war room, all of those, we call them cauliflower charts, right? So it's basically just the representations of, of the graph when we're sort of mapping the different sort of systems and then landing on what those different views of the experts were in terms of, you know, the rating, you know, how, you know, if you have particular sort of system, particular material being used, right, you know, how, how good it is. So then there'll be different, you know, different views on that as well given that you know, they may be all sort of appropriate or approved under the building standards, right? Mm. So there's been a lot of, I think, a lot of really just tra translation and really, you know, just really sort of picking up the, the knowledge, the domain knowledge, you know, and bringing everyone on the same page. That was actually the biggest, the biggest effort, I would say. Mm. I know, Charles, if you... Um, with, with those um, point estimates, I think... Um, what, what we designed in the system was to actually allow that divergence of views within the Bayesian networks. So allowing the, the industry experts to have their view and then to see the culmination in an aggregation um, actually explained a lot of the differences that they saw and the, the disagreements that they had. And they could basically just view it and say, hey, actually the industry does have divergent views on these things. And at this stage, are most of the users of the system um, the public? because they've now got a rating, or are you expecting that insurance companies and other certifiers will use it? Yeah, so, so, the, so the plan is, initially the plan was to make sure that we get the, all the builders, you know, on board, or at least the builders, you know, that want to uh, have, a, have a rating being put on the building, right? So that's the first sort of stage, and that's what we are sort of going through. The plan is, you know, I mean, the big vision, right, is that when you have a building, right, particularly a new building, I think all the building, it's a bit sort of uh, difficult because not always that information exists, but for all the build, new builds, you would just have a QR code on a building, right, and when you come with your, with your phone and you scan it, you should be able to sort of see what is the rating, right, so that was the big dream that uh, David Chandler has, and, you know, look, maybe one day <laughs> it will come true. Uh, but that's ultimately would be then used by, by the public, right? The insurers, of course, right? The insurers, bankers, et cetera, right? Will have access to that information to make sure that they can ba you know, make informed decisions in terms of the risk assessments and so on. But I think, you know, fundamentally from the construction industry perspective is, you know, you almost, you know, have a bit of a sort of self-selection process, right? Because anyone who, you know, really wants to stay in the game and want to build high quality buildings, right? They, they want, they'll be very happy to have they buildings rated, right? But all the ones that <laughs> won't necessarily want to achieve that, right? They probably won't. Mm. 